Last week we talked about um, what does Christianity look like. That is going to be the title of our series each week. We're going to continue with another attribute of Christian character. Christian character. And um, we do need to remember that God is always watching. God is always watching. And when we think no one knows or no one understands or no one sees, we need to always remember God does. He sees, He knows, and He is what life is all about anyway. We need to remember that. God is to be at the first and foremost of all of our thoughts, all of our actions. The Bible says, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of the Lord Jesus. That is what life is for, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. And so we began to look at some things last week and ask ourselves if we were to look at Christianity, what it, what would it look like? What, what should someone see when they see Christianity in our life as we would call ourselves Christians? And we find in the Bible that term was given to the followers of Jesus. And it wasn't because they just knew Jesus, but to the, they had come to the point where they had continued In the Apostles' Doctrine, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, they continued in the teachings that were given to them by Jesus. They began to live their lives around those teachings. In fact, it changed everything they were inside and as well on the outside. Sometimes those people uh, lost their jobs, they lost their homes, they lost their families, and yet they still continued to be God's disciples. They continued to follow the teachings, and much of that, uh, began with baptism. When they got saved and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the first step of obedience was them getting down and saying, I got an old life that's gone. I got a new life that's beginning. And this baptism is a picture of that old life being taken away. I've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus. I'm being buried with him. The old life's dead and I'm raised up. I'm a new person and I'm going to walk different, I'm going to talk different, I'm going to act different, I'm going to go different, I'm going to be different. Everything about me is going to be different because God changed my life. And so when we think about that in respect to what Christianity is, often people begin uh, with the uh, idea of what Christianity is, but then they get further down the road and they begin to understand, well, Christianity is a little bit more than just saying I'm on my way to heaven. Now, all of a sudden, I have the Spirit of God that continues to work in my life. I have the prompting of God. Uh, when I sin, I don't feel well anymore. It wasn't, it's not fun like it used to be. I get grieved in my heart. Something feels sick when I do things wrong. Often that's a discouragement to young Christians. And then they know they've done something wrong and, and they'll get over on the side and they'll get out of church or they'll get out of reading their Bible or they'll stop getting to be where they were. And, and it's something just like what we find back in the Garden of Eden where Adam, when he sinned, the Bible says he went and hid himself from the face of God. And and they don't know. They just know something happened, and I've done something wrong. And, and now I don't feel that joy that I had when I first got saved. And I feel like I'm I'm not going to be accepted by God anymore. And I, I don't feel like that, that you know, Christians, I, I, they probably know I'm not a good person. And all of a sudden, then they find out by somebody else who's been saved for a while, hey, hey, you know something? I haven't been always the best Christian, and I've failed God, and I've sinned against God since I've been born again. Guess what? Jesus still loves you. Jesus still gave his life for you. Jesus can still forgive you just as much as the day you got saved. You mean I can still have a clean slate? Yes, let's get on their knees and ask God to forgive us. And all of a sudden that person gets up and they got the joy of the Lord again. They're back in church again. They're reading their Bible again. They're praying again. And all of a sudden we find this continuing process that's ongoing in their life. That's what I want to talk to you tonight about. I believe one of the Christian characters characteristics or what Christianity, what would be seen in someone's life as a Christian will be just this word. Now think about this tonight, continuance, continuance. As we look uh, in this word, go with me uh, to Psalm number 92 here, Psalm number 92. We're going to look at uh, a good bit of verses tonight, and I'm excited to preach on this because anytime the Lord gives me something to speak on, I'm excited, number one, because I I know that I'm not just thinking about something, but I know that I'm thinking about what God wants me to think about in this message tonight. And so let's ask the Lord to help us here tonight as we go to Psalm number 92. And let's just bow our heads here for a moment. Father, thank you tonight that we can read your word. 
Thank you, God, we can be again together gathered in your name because you gather us from this whole rotten, dirty world. You changed our life. You saved us, Lord, not only today, but eternally. And because of that, you are continuing to do an eternal work in our life. I pray, Father, that we would be submitted to that will tonight. I pray as we read these scriptures that our eyes would be open, that you would illuminate and give us the understanding and the sense of the scriptures. I pray that, Lord, what would be said here tonight would not just be vain jangling or sounding brass, tinkling cymbals, as the scripture says, but, dear God, I pray that it would be thy spirit that would work in our hearts and lives. I pray that you would give us unction. I pray that you would give us the breath of life from heaven above through the Holy Ghost. God, I pray that your word would just give to us that life as Jesus meets here with us tonight. Through thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm number 92 here. David is rejoicing, saying it's good to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto his name. And he refers to the Lord there in verse number one as the most high. He said, it is good to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. He said in verse 3, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the work of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Now, this next verse, 6, refers to uh, the word, for lack of better words, a man without understanding or stupid, uh, for, or just to rephrase it, an unthinking man. A foolish man, a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the, now watch, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Now, don't spend too much time here on this thought, but do get it. The wicked raise up, and we think, oh, they're going to continue forever. And David told us there a scripture, excuse me, in the book of Psalms, I believe it's Psalm number 49. The wicked were described as saying they put their names of their lands after their name. They, they name their land after their own names. And they think that they will continue forever. And yet the Bible says, no, they won't. They shall surely be cut down. They shall surely perish. They shall surely be destroyed, as the scripture says, and without remedy. Suddenly they're gone. And they were here. They thought everything was going to continue. But think about this as a believer. We're going to continue with God forever and ever. The work that God began in our life will never end. It's going to continue forevermore. That's amazing to grasp a hold of that. You got everlasting life when you got saved. And it's not just eternal life when you die and go to heaven. It already began in your life. Paul told Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. Get a hold of what God wants to do in your life today in eternal work. He has a purpose for why he saved you, Timothy. And we'll get to that here in a minute. Psalm 91 or 92, says the wicked, they just raise up, but they're all of a sudden, they're gone. But look what God describes here about us as we go down in verse number 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Oh, not like grass, like the palm tree. It continues. Verse uh, number 12, look read what it says on. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Buddy, a long, long time, continuing, being planted. Verse number 13 here describes us, the righteous. Watch. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord. Now, again, it says in another scripture that we will be referred to, God's people, as the planting of the Lord. That seems strange, doesn't it? But think about the description, Psalm number one. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he or she, as we think of ourselves tonight, shall be like a tree planted. Why did God put those words in the scripture? Because that's the description of the righteous, of the godly, of the believer, and of, listen to me, the Christian. Because if we want to be like Christ, we're going to have to continue in the way of the Lord. It's a planting. And so the Bible calls it here that we will be planted in the house of the Lord. Think about how many people were in God's house in the worship of the Lord, rejoicing, and all of a sudden you say, where do you go to church? And they say, nowhere. That breaks my heart. 
when I meet people like that, people that made an influence in my life, people who directed me in the things of God, people that broke bread with me in the house of God. And you say to yourself, what happened? Why would you not be somewhere, if not anywhere, in the house of the Lord? To me, it doesn't seem to be an option. I, I believe God's going to continue in the house of God. Why should we not continue to come to the house of God? Someplace, somewhere, somehow, if at all possible. I, I can't even fathom that. But see, the world darkens people's minds. And often, God is never letting us down. But something happens in someone's life and they say, that's it, I've had enough. But God never looks at us that way. God never treats us that way, but we do to him. Isn't that sad to think about that? But I want to show you something here in the scripture as we read on. Think about this attribute. And we're not spending too much time on this, but think about God himself. You know what God said about his word? None of it will ever fail. It's always going to continue. God's promises are what? Yea and amen. So God's word is eternal. It's continuing. It's never going to change. God's nature himself is the same way. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, when God does something, no man can add to it or take away. What does that mean? It's an eternal, continuing work. That's what God wants to do in our life. This is great to think about this. In fact, can I remind you what God described himself in the word of God? One of the, the things that he referred to himself as to get us a picture of something solid, of something that will not be moved. He says in verse 15, uh, well, read on here, uh, verse 15, to show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock. There is no unrighteousness. He doesn't change. He, he is continuing righteous. He's continuing holy. He is continuing with his everlasting love. He is continuing with his everlasting goodness. He is a great God who continues on. And, and look at what verse 14 says here about us. If you would, go back to 13, describing what we're to be in the house of God. It says in verse 13, Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Verse 14, They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Now, whoa, wait a minute. You're trying to tell me it's not like the fruit of the womb? That's right. We might not be able to bear children in our older age physically, but spiritually, we are continuing to bear fruit until the day we die if we continue in the things of the Lord. That's a wonderful, wonderful promise. God says we can continue to bear fruit. You say, well, I'm 80 years old. What can God do with me? Bear fruit if you continue. Stay planted. God can do a great work. And look at this. Just a, a real quick verse since it's so close. Uh, chapter nine, uh, Psalm 93, look at verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established. That it cannot be moved. Verse 2. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. So the very work of God is an everlasting continual work. And this is what he wants to do in our lives. Now go with me to John. With, with, you, uh, with me here. John 8.31 you know this verse, but I want to read it again because it's so wonderful to think about. John chapter 8. So we, we not only have looked here about when we think about this word continuance as a, as a Christian character trait. What, a, what is it that Christianity looks like? It's, it's going to be having continuance. True Christianity is going to have continuance. And, and I, I want to say this very carefully. When we think about this word and we do this Bible study on Wednesday night here, Let's think about the idea that there is a difference between being a Christian and being a believer. I know that, that we've so put that together in our minds. But I can be a believer and I can be living not like a Christian. And we can do it tomorrow again if we do not get continually God's grace and, and continue to work the work that he wants to do in our life. If that's not taking place, we'll be a believer. We'll, we'll end up in heaven. There's no doubt about it. Every person that's ever believed on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That's God's promise. But there's a lot of people that miss the Christian life. Now, I tell you, that's, that's deep, friend, if you really think about that. There's a lot of people that came to church, even who made it to the house of God, but 
They didn't continue to apply the word of God to their life. They didn't allow God to change them in the ways that he wanted to work in their life and, and grow them. And I hope it's, and, and, and can pray, not that we're better people, listen to me, because that's, that in ourselves we'll never be better. But I hope that Christianity be, can be see greater in our life as we grow in the Lord and we continue and that we bear fruit. I hope that 20 years from now, there's still fruit in my life. Don't you? I really hope there is. I pray that there is. The only way it's going to happen is if we continue. John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said there, beginning in the words of red, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. He didn't just say you're my believers. You're my disciples. You're learning from me. You're loving me. You're following me. And then if you go with me to John 15, 9, and think about this. I know what's happened in my life, and I say that uh, not pride-filled, because I find out the more that I love God, the more unworthy I am of his love. That's what I've seen. I don't know how you've seen it. But as I look at John chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said here, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now, we look at words and we say, Oh, okay, yeah, he's saying you. I want you to continue in my love. But one of the things that gets our attention, and this is why I believe some people stop reading their Bibles or they stop going to church. It's when it goes to you sometimes. When God puts the finger on someone like that, preaching's real good until it goes like that. And, and in my case, like that, okay? I've had it. I've felt it. I've been in church before. Preacher don't have any idea what my week was, what I was doing, and all of a sudden it's like that. Coming at me, the finger. You remember the old um, uh, poster, looking for a few good men. And it was an army poster. And that guy would be going like this with the finger. And the intention of that was that that young man would be convicted and see that he has a calling and there's a need and he can be the one that fulfills that calling to answer and step up and be a countryman, be a, be a patriot, be a lover of good men, you know, in some sense here, I'm applying to scripture, but to do his part to be what he feels he should be for his country. And one of the reasons that they use that finger is because when somebody would walk by and he used those words looking for a few good men, you see, there was a reason for that. And that's how God uses his word in our lives. God speaks to us directly. It is amazing when people come to church and they get upset and they say, the preacher was preaching to me. Friend, that's why I come to church. I never, I don't understand how anybody can get offended when we sit here and say, Lord, speak to my heart. And then all of a sudden somebody says, man, I know he was preaching to me. Well, what, who, what, did you come here to hear God? I did. Why does that surprise us when God actually gets on us and tells us something in our life that needs to be cleaned up, shaped up, built up? It would make sense. And God's good, isn't he? He answers our prayers. But maybe we just didn't realize what we was really praying for. Amen. We want the sweet stuff of God sometimes. We just want all dessert, don't we? But God gives us the full course because he knows what we need for strength in our life. And so he said, continue in his love, didn't he? Praise God, continue. Now look at this. So, so don't be surprised. And again, don't be surprised if sometimes God points at you and says, I'm talking to you. That's okay. It's because God wants you to be part of the army of the Lord. He wants you to be able to fight and be effective. Acts chapter 14. Look at this. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. It is a description of us as believers continuance now when we when we go here to verse 22 i want you to see something here what paul said and this was often how he preached and what he did after he saw people converted to the lord he said that conversion process isn't over how many of you are still in the process of being converted i am see it's not i changed to the baptist religion that's not conversion that's called getting in a Bible preaching church, okay? Uh, conversion is a 
changing. You're being converted. You're being changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that should kill, go on until the day we die, until the Lord Jesus returns. That's what should be going on today in our life. Conversion. And so Paul is continuing to preach. And then when people are getting saved, look at verse 22. Confirming the souls, he's going behind. He's, he's, he's trying to get encouragement to them. The souls of the disciples and exhorting them to, there it is, continue in the faith. Well, to the, to the, the, um, novice here or to the unlearned Christian who doesn't know their Bible, that might sound like, oh, that means they could fall out of the faith or they could get unsaved. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying Christianity is the faith. It's the way we live. It's what we do. It's what we think. It's what we feel about God. It's what we know about ourselves. It's what we learn about God and how to live our life. It's always continuing to grow. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. And the scripture's full of that. And the book of Colossians talks about that. So he's continuing and he says, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now there's the big reason why many people give up and get out because something comes in their life that every person deals with whether it's tribulation as the scripture says here whether it's temptation or whether it's trials which some of that goes in one and the same they give up go with me back to matthew 13 here matthew 13 notice the description of those who heard the word of god who received it the bible says there was four different results of that seed. You remember that? Here it is. Here's the second one described. Verse 20. The second the second one here. The first one this just fell on stony places. The birds ate it. Verse 20. The second one. But he that received the seed in stony places. The same as he that heareth the word. And anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself. But endureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. But look at this fourth one, verse 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. We are to be obviously in that verse number 23 and we should not follow the attributes of these false converts. That's what we're looking at in verse number 20. False converts. They really didn't get salvation in their life. They are not going to continue and nor should it be said of us that we didn't continue. All right. Look also here, if you would, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter four, last book that Apostle Paul wrote from prison to Timothy. And just just this is a great chapter. It's so amazing how much is in this chapter when I, I prayed about what to preach on tonight. Look at look at we're gonna come down here towards the end of the message. We've just got uh, two more verses after this, two more scriptures. But second Timothy chapter four, look at this with me, please. Look at verse number one. I charge thee therefore before God. Last chapter. Last thing Paul is ever going to write here. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, it's easy to preach when everybody wants to hear. It's easy to preach when everything's easy to preach. But man, Paul's saying to Timothy, keep on keeping on. He's saying to Timothy, don't rust out. Don't burn out. But Timothy, what you need to do is finish out the course that God has for you in your life. By the way, Paul's writing 2 Timothy. It didn't end with 1 Timothy. Aren't you glad for that? Because Timothy, as a young preacher, said, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to endure it out. Have you ever thought maybe Timothy might have looked at the life of Paul after all he had been through and said, if Paul could do it without quitting, 
I can do it without quitting. You see, you're making more of a difference in people's lives than you realize when they look at you, when you go through things and you continue on with the Lord and they say, huh, I don't have much of an excuse because they got a lot more than I do and they're still going on than I need to keep going on. And ultimately, if we follow that all the way back, I'm going to just get to the end of my message here. You're going to find out people are really looking to the Lord to keep continuing in the direction they need to go. That's how Paul kept going on. Notice he says here um, in verse number five, but watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Endure. Is it easy to start out? Oh, you bet. You bet. You know I can run a marathon? How many of you know I can run a marathon? Today we, we visited for the adoption class and I looked up on the wall because that's what boys do when somebody's teaching them. They get distracted and start reading things on the wall. And I said, marathon. Wow, this girl ran a marathon? That's amazing. And I thought, 26 miles? That's crazy. Who would sign up for that? But you know, I could run a marathon. Maybe for a mile. <laughs> maybe for a mile. I know I could do maybe a quarter mile. But I could run a marathon. But I guarantee you I'm not going to finish the marathon. And Christians, we think that way sometimes. Man, I'm saved. I can't wait. This is going to be great. But friend, you didn't get into a 100-meter dash. You got into a marathon. And we'll find something here very interesting about this marathon. Read on here just for a minute. We're going to find out how we can finish this race that we're supposed to run. Verse 7, Paul said, verse 6, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. And there it is. I have finished my course. You say, what's what's Paul doing? He's stretching forth right now when he's writing this to Paul or to Timothy, and he's feeling the finish line rope just snapping, boom, as he's going through it. And he's saying, the race is done, Timothy. I ran the whole thing. I made all 26 miles, which is very interesting because Paul's ministry was just about almost 30 years. It's, it's a blessing to think about that. What did God do with Paul? You know what he did? Everything he intended to do because Paul kept on running. Can you get that tonight, Christian, in your life? What is it that God wants to do in my life? And what would I miss if I didn't continue on allowing him to work and do what he wants to do? I don't want to miss what God wants to in my life. I hope you can say that tonight. And as a result of that, he says uh, here in verse 9, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now watch verse 10. Isn't it interesting? He's talking about finishing the course. And we've got a description here of two men. Don't miss this. Paul continued and finished his course. But look at this verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me. We find Demas mentioned in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, and verse 14. He's with Paul in the ministry. Demas greets you. We find in Philemon, chapter 1, verse 24, he's mentioned as well. And here, at the end of Paul's life, he's saying, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And we can think, well, you know, maybe he just decided not to be in the ministry. There must have been something else here. Because Paul had an insight on Demas' life. He said, Demas loved the world more than he loved God and the ministry. And Demas obviously missed something in his life. And it says he has departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. And isn't that interesting? Paul said Cretans, Crescens to Galatia, he left him. Titus to unto Dalmatia, he left him. But the Bible doesn't tell us here that Paul said anything against those men because he believed they were following the Lord. But something in Demas' life was different. He was following his own will instead of God's. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. See, not everybody, play, everybody leaves Heritage Baptist Church or wherever we are in life. We can't, it's nothing worse than hearing somebody in the ministry and they're like, nobody's going to serve God anymore because they're not with us. No, that's not how it works. Not everybody leaves us for the wrong reason. But Demas left for the wrong reason. There's plenty of places out there to serve God and live for God besides Heritage Baptist Church. You agree tonight? I believe that. 
But then it goes on to say, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Wow, what a statement there. But look at this other guy mentioned. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Could Mark have quit in the ministry when he got into that little dispute with Paul and Barnabas and they're fighting and, and, and Silas? Remember all that little fighting going on? Mark could have said, you know what? I'm not even, I don't even want nothing to do with the ministry anymore. Paul don't want me? Fine. No, Mark said, I'll go here with Barnabas or I'll go with Silas and Barnabas, you know, go with Paul, if I remember right. So they split up, but Mark stayed in the ministry. And as a result of that, guess what? Mark continued in the Lord, and to the end, he got to help Paul in the ministry. Just a little bit there in Scripture. Now, Acts chapter 26. We'll close here. Acts chapter 26. You ready for the answer of how we can continue? All right, Pastor, I know. you. I get the point. God wants me to continue. He wants me to persevere, push through. Um. Did you know that purpose in our lives has eternal consequences? Think about all those in this world who had a purpose to do the right thing and the eternal consequences that was a result of having that purpose in their life. Jesus' purpose to go to the cross. Think of the eternal consequences of that. There were those that purposed to do to destroy our nation Bring in communism, and guess what? It was eternal consequences as a result of that. Think about it. Those that realize and get a hold of the purpose and, and live for that purpose, it will make eternal consequences, good or bad. And Christian, we need to understand that. We need to have a purpose. And how can we do that? How can we continue? Well, look at Acts 26, verse number 22. To keep from fading out. To keep from rusting out, to keep from burning out. Acts 26, verse 22. I believe here's the answer. This is good. You say, well, that's simple. Look at the first phrase. It's the answer. Having therefore obtained help of God. You see, how am I going to continue? How am I going to not give up? Obtain help of God. It's really that simple. Do you know? the reason why people did not continue to become what God wanted them to be. Do you know the answer? It's right there in that verse. God wanted to give them the grace, but they said, I don't need God's help. I'm fine. I don't need the Lord's intervention in my life. And for whatever reason, something came and they said, I'm not going to continue. But God would have wanted to have helped and they could have obtained that help. And they could have, according to Scripture here, Paul said in the end of his life, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great because he had God's help in his life. And according to Hebrews 12, we'll close here, we find that Scripture revealed. The answer. How can we have this Christian attribute in our life? How can... Christianity be seen in this area of continuance in our life. Just simply being able to go go on for Jesus, follow on for Jesus, walk on with Jesus, no matter what comes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Or verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So the reason they gave up physically or bodily in the will of God is because spiritually they gave up. Perhaps they were focused on their own inadequacies, their failures, their sins, instead of keeping their eyes on the Lord, receiving the grace of God, receiving the help that can be obtained of Him, as Paul just told us in Acts 26, 22. And God tells us here, consider Him. Aren't you glad that Jesus, when He was coming... Now think about it. Go from the beginning of His life. Let's just think about this as we, as we close our Bible. Think about this. Consider Him. 
when he came into this world, from the very day he was rejected. No room in the inn, out there with the critters, out with the animals. As soon as he's born, Herod tries to kill him. Raised up as a boy in the, the house of God, reading everything's just fine, and then all of a sudden he reveals himself of who he is. And from the moment of that beginning of his ministry at 30 years old, they tried to kill him. They tried to crucify him. They tried to stone him. They tried to throw him over a cliff. They tried to accuse him. It never, ever ended. And yet he continued on. And can I remind you, Jesus was just as much a man or a human being as you and I are tonight. With the points that we're tempted with of quitting and failing. And yet the Bible tells us, and I like this thought, he went further. He went further, friend. And if he wouldn't have went further, you know what? He wouldn't have went to the cross and he wouldn't have died and he wouldn't have paid for our sins. And that wasn't far enough. He went and rose up out of the grave and then he went into heaven. And you know what? The work of God is still continuing. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And so I believe we need to have the same kind of eternal work in our lives. Let's bow our heads here just for a moment before we go to our prayer group. Number one, what does continuance look like? Well, we've seen many examples tonight, and especially in the life of Jesus. That's the first thing we have to ask ourselves. If Christianity looks like this, and we've seen it in all these examples, and God, I want it to be seen in my life. We know what it doesn't look like. We can probably all come up with a face or a name here tonight of somebody. And we say to ourselves, what happened to them? Why? What went wrong? And then we're led back to that verse like Demas. And we think about those that went away. And then we have to ask ourselves tonight, God, how can I continue? How can I not? I'm going to deal with things. Those people probably didn't think that they would be in the position they're in today or the wrong direction they went in their life. God, I need to continue. I need to obtain help from you. And that's the answer. So that others can see my life and see that God has been faithful and helped me through all things and he'll do the same in their life. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for this message. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your instruction and in righteousness. I pray that our lives, Lord, would be a living example. I pray that, God, you would give us something that we do not have in ourselves. All of us here in this place tonight have considered quitting once, twice, several times. But, God, I thank you that you have done an eternal work in our life. Lord, that you show to us what we would miss if we just threw our hands up in the air and said, why bother? Why continue on? Lord, first of all, the greatest of all reasons is that we see you when we follow you and seek you with all of our hearts. And there is no greater reason to live than that, to see your living presence in our life, to walk with you, to know you, to love you, and to be with you, Lord. And as you commune with us day by day, moment by moment, I believe that's the greatest reason, Lord, to continue because you are a great and loving almighty God. You gave your life for us and you love us. I pray that we would be reminded of that love tonight. And God, I pray that we would ask for your help and Lord, receive that grace that is available to us to keep on keeping on. And God, we're going to give you the glory for it because we know we can't do it without you. And Father, I thank you, Lord, again for your word tonight. Be with us as we go here to our prayer groups. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.